Coming up on Chopper's Politics. They haven't come to terms with it. They don't really understand that we're no longer a member state. And until such time as they do recognise that, then I think that these difficulties will continue. I'm Christopher Hope, a.k.a. Chopper, the Telegraph's chief political correspondent, and this is Chopper's Politics. Welcome back. It was a week of lawmaking. You must not meet socially in groups of more than six. And if you do, you will be breaking the law. And law breaking. Yes, this does break international law in a very specific and limited way. We are taking the power to disapply the EU law concept of direct effect required by Article 4. In a certain it feels like, for the first time in a while, Brexit hasn't had to take a back seat because of everything else going on. It's back on the agenda in a big way. And this week, we'll be catching up with the Vice Chairman of the European Research Group of Backbench Tory MPs, David Jones, to talk about why this deal, this oven-ready deal, was found to have the wrong ingredients, apparently, because the government's trying to change bits of it, much to the annoyance of the European Union. But first, now about this time of year, normally I'm packing my hold all and my pyjamas and my favourite teddy bear, and I'm off to a Brighton hotel to go to the TUC Annual Congress. I've been going for about 20 years now. The brothers know me well. But rules are rules in this COVID-19 world. So, heading up the Congress remotely, and joining me also remotely, is the head of the TUC, the National Organisation of British Trade Unions, Francis O'Grady. Francis O'Grady, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Now, normally I'd be packing my hold all for Brighton, but where is your conference next week? Well, we're going to be running Congress from Congress House, our headquarters in London, and it will be online, Chris. So, in fact, in many ways, perhaps even more people will be able to participate from all walks of life, and I'm sure it'll be lively as always. Well, they can certainly watch it. Can they ask questions there? That's a crucial thing. I I don't think you'll ever stop a trade unionist asking uh, questions. (laughs) But I think, you know, this year we're really focused on jobs, on security and dignity at work. Obviously, in the midst of a pandemic, that matters more than ever. Yeah, and the issue of safety workers is something we'll come back to. Uh, What proportion of TUC staff are at work in Congress House? We've got small numbers at the moment. I've taken the judgment that I would much rather that we work with our own staff unions and that we take slow and steady steps. The building is COVID secure, but you know, we've got lots of people working at home, people using the office on a hybrid basis. I think flexibility is the name of the game, especially given what we heard yesterday with the Prime Minister's announcement about new social restrictions. I think, you know, there's still a lot of kind of concern that we have to put safety first. Are they working hard enough when, they, when you can't <laughs> see them? I know your, your gimlet gaze will stare out from beyond your lovely office, which I've been to in Congress House. I'm, I'm not just saying this, but our staff team have been incredible through this. And I know that's true of trade union officers across the movement because uh, we certainly haven't been short of work to do. Well, of course. But I asked the question because number 10 raised the issue last week of getting people back to work in case you might lose your job or the work bosses may, may, may think you're shirking and going for secret dog walks at four in the afternoon. Yeah, I thought that was a, a misjudgment. You know, millions of people obviously have been at work, uh, working right through this crisis. Uh, key workers, not just NHS and social care, but transport, posters, refuse collectors. But also millions of people have been working really hard from home too. And, and it's not always easy if you don't have a garden, if your bedroom's a bit cramped and if you've got kids under your feet, you know, it's not easy. So I think people need a bit of praise and encouragement and also a bit of respect for people's common sense because, you know, I think most of us have got, you know, different feelings about this, mixed feelings. Uh, certainly for me, I really miss the banter and the company of being at work all the time. But I know that when I had small kids, any flexibility would have been really precious and valued. You know, people don't need to be patronised about this. I think uh, if people feel confident that work is safe, and also what I have to admit, what I've heard from loads and loads of workers is that they're as worried about getting to work safely and getting home again as they are about 
safety at work. Do you think we're over, are we over worrying it? Are we over worrying about, shouldn't it be a question of the individual worker should know how they should police their lives? If you have a, an elderly person at home, then you can ask for the right to work from home because you need to, because you've got to protect that person. But equally, can't it be down to us to manage our, our own risk in the same way if I drive my car, the risk is on me. It shouldn't be on the country to keep me safe. I know we have speed limits, but yeah, you see what I mean. we have speed limits and we have to wear safety belts. And I, th- I suppose what we've learned, haven't we, is that there is such a thing as society that we do owe it to each other. That the problem is, if there is an outbreak of the virus in a fast fashion you know, sweatshop, that it's not just the staff who potentially suffer, it's the bus drivers, it's the families at home, and it's neighbours too. So we do have a responsibility to keep each other safe. But I do trust in people's good common sense. And that's why I don't think it's always helpful to make announcements that seem to change as well from week to week, you know, get back to work. I think trust in business and unions and workers to sort out a sensible approach. And if we do have cowboys, like some of those food processing plants or fast fashion outfits, then let's crack down on them quickly because it puts everybody else at risk. Do you worry more about the safety of workers or the economic effect of a prolonged and enforced lockdown? I don't see it as a competition. I think getting the safety right, getting on top of this virus is the key to unlocking the economy. Um, and we need both, you know, of course. We all worry about lives. But, uh, and surely and a balance, Francis. Surely a balance there. Well, what I do know is that if we don't get on top of the virus and if we ended up with a whole series of major lockdowns, then we're in trouble. And that's that's one of the reasons why, you know, we have argued really hard for getting on top of this test and trace system. I think that's the key. You know, what we're seeing now at the moment is quite large scale lockdowns still. Whereas I think in other countries whose test and trace systems are working much more effectively, you can really micro target. And, you know, if you act fast, crack down fast, there's no need for a kind of form of collective punishment, if you like. It's You can really target your act, actions and interventions. But people have got to be able to afford to self-isolate when they should. So we do need decent sick pay too. Of course. And which politicians are addressing your, your Congress's conference next week? Uh, we've got Keir Starmer on Tuesday, who will be addressing uh, Congress. But you know, that's, that's our tradition. Uh, but as you know, Chris, we, <laughs> we talk to politicians of all stripes. And, you know, for example... Yeah, I, just, we... I, just, I only <laughs> asked because I, I, when I last looked, the TUC was politically neutral. So I wonder why you got the Labour leader speaking to it, not the Tory, well, Tory business I've, secretary. I've never made any secret of the fact that our history and our values lie with the... Labour Party and, you know, our values of decency and dignity at work. But we always... Well, the Tories are decent decent too, though, Francis. And I have publicly uh, praised Rishi Sunak when we, you know, saw the introduction of that job retention scheme that obviously saved and supported over 9 million jobs and many more self-employed too. Not perfect, but that shows when we do get around the table, when we work out practical solutions together, we can make a big difference. And of course, the big question is what happens next? Sadly, it doesn't look like this virus is going to be beaten by the end of October. So we are going to have to look at how we support jobs and the economy as the best way to get us through, get get through this. Well, we're looking for, you know, we've made a sectoral pra- furlough. We've made a practical proposition to the Chancellor. Let's let's look at where employers can get workers back at least part-time, you know, for a minimum number of hours. And use that downtime to invest in training and skilling up workers. That's an investment for the future. Then we should look at continuing wage support. We're still going to need an aviation industry. We're still going to need arts and culture when we're through this. We're definitely going to need manufacturing and steel if we're going to earn our way in the world. So let's let's put our heads together and figure out a practical plan so that we don't end up with the misery of mass unemployment.
you have ad- adult children, and because, I, because I'm not with you in the room, I can ask if you're a grandparent yet. No, I'd love to be. <laughs> I'm just, I just thinking, I hope you... they don't hear that, but uh, it probably wouldn't be a surprise to them. I wonder what you thought of this rule of six, because it is meaning a lot of grandparents can't see larger families, extended families. Is it, is it appropriate, this idea of a, of a force of people snooping to see if you're gathering in more than six I people know, it's so hard I mean as as I I mean I come from a reasonably big family myself and um you know I I think it is it is really really tough and one other real big practical problem of course is just how many people rely on grandparents uh, for informal child care you know we've just done a a whole load of work with working parents, working mums in particular feeling the pressure because although kids may be back to school, a lot of nurseries are in trouble, breakfast clubs after school clubs aren't necessarily back up and running. And of course, yeah, you know, if apart from the love and cuddles, you know, the the practical support that grandparents give, it's going to be a tough old winter, I think, for, for many people with young kids. Francis O'Grady, you've got Keir Starmer speaking next week, not Jeremy Corbyn. Are you relieved he's no longer the leader? Look, I think Keir Starmer is proving to be a great leader. You know, I know it's only anorak who watch uh, PMQs, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think anybody can doubt his sincerity, um, his heart but also he's got a very sharp brain and um and it's he's important. also electable he's also it, electable isn't he for middle England. i think he's proving to be popular in the country I, th- I think this is a time when you know it's a serious time and people want serious leaders and they want you know people to understand the problems the everyday problems that we're all facing and have practical ideas about how we sort them out i think it is important including us that you know, we work constructively at a time of crisis. Uh, I think people don't want bickering. They want practical ideas about how we sort things out. But but we also need to have a government that will listen. I think it's important to think about the values that lie at the heart of this. You know, what, what matters to me is jobs, um, you know, the dignity of being able to work and get on in life safety, security. We've still got, you know, a growing number of people on zero hours contracts. And then we've got social care workers who put their health on the line during this crisis, being threatened that they may not get a minimum wage increase. I think that is, that offends me. And I'm pretty sure it offends lots of people in this country. So I think we all of us actually need to think a bit harder about values and what really matters. And if we've learned anything through this crisis, it should be about the incredible, valuable work that NHS, social care and all public service and key workers do. And frankly, you know, I've seen lots of ministers quite rightly joining that applause for key workers. I think it's time to make sure they're rewarded in every sense. What have you missed most about not being in the office? I'm, I miss the banter. I've got great workmates and, you know, um, I mean, I've been coming in obviously now and again, uh, but obviously uh, lots of people have childcare issues, transport issues, just like everybody else. So, you know, Zoom and all of that is fine, Yes, <laughs> but it's ish. not the same. Not and, the same. You know, I think we've done a good job. we you know, we're determined to keep fighting for decent conditions and to protect jobs. But I I do miss the company. And just a final question. I can ask this remotely. So, so you say so you won't be cross with me, but you made history as being the first woman leader of the TUC. You turned 60 last year. You've been in post for eight years. Brendan Barber did nine years. Have you used lockdown to think about your future plans? <laughs> I think this is the honest truth. My feet, my feet have not touched the ground during this pandemic. Um, you know, uh, the one thing about these Zoom meetings is that you seem to pack an awful lot more of them into every day. And you know, but in terms and that's of your right. future, Francis O'Grady, I, you're, I'm you're always going to keep going. I'm always going to be a trade unionist, whatever contribution I can make. You know, I believe in the cause of 
workplace justice. I want to see people getting a decent deal. So however way, whatever way I can contribute, I will. But there's, there's, you know, there's a bit of life in the old dog left yet. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere for now. Um, but, you know, this is a collective movement uh, and we're growing. And I think more and more people are seeing the value of being in a union that will watch your back. On that note, Francois O'Grady, the TUC's General Secretary, thank you for talking to this week's Chavez Politics. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. OK, in just a moment, we'll be going back to our Brexit podcast roots. I'll be talking to former Brexit Minister David Jones, currently the Vice Chairman of the European Research Group of Tory MPs, about the backstop, Brandon Lewis, and something limited and specific, right after this. Hello, I'm Katie Morley and I'm the Telegraph's Consumer Champion. It's a big job title, but what it really means is I spend my days helping readers who are being ripped off. I've heard from victims of wicked scams, insurance customers who can't get payouts and customers who've been treated badly by retailers. I've seen it all and I've managed to win back over £2 million for our readers in a year. But I couldn't have done it without our subscribers. And that's where you come in. If you subscribe to The Telegraph, you're helping fund public service journalism like this, as well as great podcasts like Choppers. So to support what we're doing and to get unlimited access to a huge range of world-class journalism, head to telegraph.co.uk slash chopper, where we have a special listener offer you can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph online. And after that, it's just £2 a week. That's telegraph.co.uk slash chopper or click on the link in the show notes to this episode. And we're back. Now, a long time ago, this podcast was called Chopper's Brexit Podcast, but we changed our name when Britain left the European Union in January. And that, we thought, was that. How wrong could we be? Because this week, Brexit is back once again on the agenda. And with me now to discuss the latest developments is former Brexit Minister David Jones. David Jones, the Vice Chairman of the European Research Group of Tory MPs, welcome back to Chopper's Politics. It's good to be back. Now, why on earth are we talking about Brexit? I thought we got over it. I mean, this podcast has changed its name since we started talk- last talking about politics and Brexit. Well, I'm afraid that Brexit's going to be very much on the agenda for certainly the next few weeks, if not months. And uh, that's principally because we're coming towards the end of the transition period and the government is attempting to negotiate a future relationship with the EU yeah. and is getting into uh, some difficulties. So I think that that's the reason why everybody's talking about Brexit again. Now, this week, Michel Barnier is finishing his eighth round of talks with the PM's chief negotiator, David Frost, Lord Frost, of course, after he was ennobled this week. Have they all been a waste of time? Well, I think that they could have been more productive. The the big problem has been, so far as I can see, that the EU refused to talk about anything except their so-called red lines, which is fisheries, and uh, the so-called level playing field, and also the issue of state aid. Uh, The problem is that the uh, British government have made it absolutely clear that our waters are British waters, and whilst we're prepared to allow the Europeans access to our waters, we're not going to uh, allow them effectively to create the common fisheries policy. And, of course, the same applies to the other issues too. So they've got into a, a, a bit of a rut, I'm afraid. What matters more to the ERG, state aid or fish? Which Of those two areas, which one should the government blink on? I don't think that the government should be blinking on any of these areas, certainly so far as fishery is concerned. It's a very important, almost iconic issue, which Mm. has been the source of much grievance by the fishing communities for the last 50 years. But state aid is important too, because if we accept the EU's terms, we're going to end up subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Yeah. And the level playing field too is, uh, is also unacceptable because that means we will not be able to put our own regulatory regime in place. So they're all important issues for, for the UK. 
Of course. Now, you, now you fought and won your seat in North Wales at the December 2019 general election. And part of that election, Boris Johnson led the party on saying there was an oven-ready Brexit deal to get Britain out of the European Union. So why on earth is the government changing that deal now? Well, it's not so much changing the deal. It's making preparation for what happens if there is no deal and there is a situation whereby the EU expect us to remain indefinitely in the uh, so-called Northern Ireland Protocol of the Withdrawal Agreement. The fact is that uh, if the EU refuse to negotiate with us, then it's very clear that the government will have no option other than to move forward with an interpretation of the uh, withdrawal agreement that protects British interests, because otherwise we'll be, frankly, in a position whereby, for example, uh, goods passing from Great Britain to Northern Ireland will be subject to the EU customs code and subject to EU tariffs. Uh, And that, of course, is not fair on the people of Northern Ireland, uh, and it's arguably also uh, contrary to the, uh, the the Good Friday Agreement. But this deal was agreed and signed off by Boris Johnson and by Parliament in January this year. Brandon Lewis said that it was breaching or changing the law in a limited way, didn't he, in the House of Commons. Don't you think the damage to unilaterally renegotiating part of a treaty is much worse than the deal they're offering? I have to say I was very surprised by that remark of Brandon Lewis because it doesn't seem to me that it amounts to a breach of international law. What it does is allow the domestic courts of this country to uh, come forward with an interpretation of the agreement that is in the British national interest. Um, the, The withdrawal agreement will remain in place. But all these issues could be resolved, frankly, if we had a free trade agreement in place. And one really wonders why the EU is so unwilling to talk about the terms of that free trade agreement, because that is the way that both sides would achieve what they want. uh, And it would be massively in the economic interests of both the UK and the European Union. They seem unwilling to recognise that the UK is now a sovereign third-party country. Is that the problem? That is the problem. In fact, the expression that David Frost uses is that they've not internalised it. They haven't come to terms with it. They don't really understand that we're no longer a member state. And until such time as they do uh, recognise that, then I think that these difficulties will continue. But they really haven't got much time to get used to the new state of affairs. Do you think the damage, though, to the UK internationally on, on you know, in, integrity and honesty and the fact with the cradle of democracy is worth these changes in, in the internal markets bill? Well, I don't actually believe that there will be that damage, provided it's properly explained why this is being done. And I think that the important part uh, of this whole uh, business to remember is this. The withdrawal agreement is an agreement between two parties and both have obligations. Now, both have got obligations to use best endeavours, negotiating in good faith to achieve a free trade agreement if they can. Furthermore, uh, the European Union, under the terms of the political declaration, has got to negotiate respecting the sovereignty of the United Kingdom and the integrity of the UK internal market. They haven't done any of that. And I think that it's the EU who are pretty badly in breach of the agreement And that needs to be explained to the wider international community. Is it the case that the measures in the Internal Markets Bill, which might amend the Northern Ireland Protocol, do they fall away if we get a deal with the European Union at the end of December? Well, of course, it depends on the deal. But if it's a free trade agreement, then what I think the British government would be looking for is for that agreement to supersede or, if you like, absorb the provisions of the uh, of the withdrawal agreement. So in other words, it would become unnecessary. And the the ideal would be a new treaty, a new free trade agreement, which, if you like, set the clock ticking from uh, from day one, rather than allowing this state of affairs to drone on for many years.
Yeah, droning on is the right thing. But this podcast never drones on, David Jones. <laughs> but, but I know what you mean. It uh, has triggered a few people's reactions and they've just basically dressed down the arguments from last year, haven't they, this week, when Brexit emerges. It doesn't seem to have divided the Tory party in the same way. For example, the One Nation Caucus seems quite content with this twiddling with the edges of it. I mean, there's some concern about the withdrawal agreement being amended. That's come from very high level in the party. Theresa May, John Major, even apparently Lord Howard in the House of Lords on, on Thursday says something similar. So there is concern, isn't there, about it? But in terms of the problems of last year, the kind of zombie parliament, we're not going back to that territory, are we? No, certainly not. Uh, the government has got a, a strong majority as a result of the general election. So I would fully expect that all colleagues in the, in, the, in the parliamentary party will be uh, behind this bill. There may be one or two people who have reservations, but I don't think that the Commons will be a problem. Uh, when we get to the House of Lords, we'll have to see how they respond. But ultimately, I think the bill will get through. Do you fear any legal action from the European Union as a result of this? Yes, they may well come up with some form of legal action. But if they do that, of course, it's going to be in the European Court of Justice. So yep. given that we will no longer be a member of the European Union, it would probably be a, fi a pretty futile exercise. Look, this is a, a state of affairs that calls for goodwill uh, on both sides. I think that th the fact is we've now ended the period of shadow boxing. The EU yep. should talk to us about all the issues. Uh, and certainly the resignation of Sir Jonathan Jones, uh, one of the top legal counsels in government, surely should indicate to the to the European Union that the guys running the negotiations now are not afraid of a no deal. No, I think that that's absolutely right. The government is determined to get this legislation through and the resignation of permanent secretaries here or there will not make much difference. Yeah. Are you scared of a no-deal exit, David Jones? No, I'm not, because we would simply be trading with the EU as we do with uh, the rest of the world. Uh, in fact, we'd be trading with the EU on the same basis, for example, as China trades with it, and they seem to do pretty well. And the ERG is content, is it? You've written for The Telegraph this week. I think Bernard Jenkins issued some remarks in support. He's chairman of the steering group of, on the ERG. Last year, you, you, your group was the Spartans, along with The Telegraph, that held out against everybody for the deal that we finally went through in January. Is that still safe? Yeah, I, I, I believe that it is. And uh, what I would say is that the ERG is fully supportive of the government here. I think that there's been an awful lot of hysteria generated. But when you look at what is proposed, it isn't, um, it isn't so frightening as is being suggested. And David Jones, just finally, the odds on getting a deal, what are your odds? I know what the number 10 say. What are your odds? Well, I would very much hope that at the last moment something will be arrived at. But I think that at the moment it looks pretty much like it's... Uh, pretty strongly in favour of no deal. 10% chance of a deal? Maybe a bit more, but it requires good 20. will. Yeah, 20, 25, that sort of thing. Goodness gracious. Well, David Jones, please do come back on Chopper's Politics. We won't rename it Chopper's Brexit Podcast in your honour, but we'll, we'll still have you on. Thank you so much for coming on. All the best. Thanks very much. Well, that's all for today. If you enjoyed the show, please do tell your friends about it and please do leave a five-star rating for us, maybe even a short review on Apple Podcasts. That's what Diz Daz Doz did. Try saying that before your morning coffee. Whoever they are, they said, the best political podcast always on the money. Well, thank you, Diz Daz Doz. And thanks to everyone who leaves us reviews. It really helps other people find this podcast and boosts us up the podcast charts. Thanks to my guests this week, Francis O'Grady and, of course, David Jones. Thanks to my producers, Louisa Wells, Elliot Lampett and Theo Luludis. You can read all of our expert coverage on politics, the coronavirus pandemic and everything else in between completely free for 30 days when you take out a trial Telegraph subscription. And after that, it'll be just £2 a week. Not much, really, is it? Just head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. If you want to get in touch, please email me. The address is chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk. You can find us on Twitter at Choppers Podcast. And of course, please do, if you can, buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. It's great value and we do appear most days, Extinction Rebellion willing. Until next time, cheerio! Cheerio!